Hello, my name is Tobias Kopka at DDux on Twitter, Melkor in the demo scene. I've been in the demo scene since 92 in groups like Howjob and Agnostic Front, usually bringing people together at parties like Evoke with Digitale Kultur e.V. And very happy to be here on Scene World podcast. So enjoy the next episodes. All right, so uh, today we are, uh, well, no, wrong, wrong beginning. Well, welcome to the Steam World podcast. <laughs> hello, hello. With the new section with Dennis Karimani and Georg Dröge. And um, in a minute, we will talk to Jan Cavalier, um, head from the East Asia um office from Retrollers Without Borders, and we will talk about the expansion of the Unsort library in Minecraft by Reporters Without Borders for the country Belarus. So press freedom in Belarus will be a topic. But before we talk about that, I have some news here. And um, so let's start with that. Here we so, go. Yeah. Yeah. So the first news item was, I don't know if you noticed it, but um, TRSI, the Red Serpent Invasion, was released as a preview um, for the C64, the first real first-person shooter, so to speak. Coding magic again from the TRSI guys. Absolutely amazing. Well, magic depends on how you see it. I mean, the yeah. technique yeah. To, to make it happen is actually something that was already used, for example, in Lemmings, which was the last mainstream ah. commercial um, video game for a uh, com uh, computer game for the Commodore 64, which is basically also used a technique they used for Turrican and stuff that you use Charizard for the for the environment graphics instead of yeah. bitmap graphics. Mm -hmm. And um, and of course they artificially minimized the few the few field field of view for the game. Yeah. Um, of course, on top of that, because it's 3D, it's a 3D maze, they made um, artificial interlace. So um, so you can actually have a decent speed. Sounds all pretty magic to me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But but just to point out, it's not something like yeah. it's totally new techniques and uh, tricks and stuff that weren't used before. The thing is, there was just not a group that had the strengths and the um, well, the I don't know, the teamwork efforts to, yeah. to make a final game. So far, we only had previews. So let's hope this game will get finished. Um, well, the thing is that uh, many people say there has been a full first-person shooter in the Commodore 64, which was a super CPU conversion of Wolfenstein 3D. Oh. But the thing is, but the thing is, not many people have a super CPU, and it's rather an MS-DOS conversion than dedicated assembler C64 code, you know. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. Well, so anyways, that's something to look forward to. Um, yeah. yeah. And um, the next thing is actually something for uh, the PC. And that's there, there has been made a conversion of Sonic Triple Trouble from the Game Gear for the PC. Ah, wow. So good game. Good game. Yes. For game Gear. A bit overlooked, but. Um... Yeah, sounds good that it's now on the PC, yeah? Cool. Exactly, yes. And and the thing is, exactly like the first-person shooter, um, it's free. You can download it for free and play. Wow. So it's a fan project, um, totally, well, not endorsed or in any way involved by Sega. It's officially unofficial. Of, official, unofficial, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. So anyway, it can be downloaded. 
So that's pretty nice. And um, also, last but not least, there is this last thing that happened and that where somebody on Reddit under the banner of come invest in the Amico has released leaked internal in television Amico documents, presentations wow. and stuff. And um, yeah, and one of, one, of, one of those slides actually, um, well, had an exit strategy, how to exit the project and let somebody else take over. Could be interesting leaks. Uh, I think uh, some Definitely. controversial stuff again. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, among those, for example, was <clears throat> using Tommy Tellerico's fame to, uh, to, well, to convince people to invest in the project. Mm. Mm. Because they are starstruck. Dirty. They are starstruck. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think these are probably some very dirty leaks and um, Definitely. Yeah, fun to watch, probably. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Pat and Ian from the ZU podcast already made an episode about it. Um, we will link to the snippet, of course. It was fun. Well, I mean, I mean, I mean, we had Tommy Tillerico and Hans Eppisch from Intellivision back then, also two times in the panel for Gamescom and um, and an interview with them for the podcast. But we didn't invite them because of the fame of Tommy Tillerico, just because um, we thought it's an interesting project. Mm, so, mm. you know, but of course, if you if you look at other YouTubers. Um, some people, some of those smaller YouTubers were like, I'm friends with Tommy Tillerico. Mm, mm. Yeah, nah, not really, you know. You don't really make quickly friends like that with, with somebody being so much high up the ladder, um, the ladder on, on fame, you know. That's at least how I see it, so. That's the point, that's the point, so. Um... Yeah. Yeah, but um, I think the whole um, Amico thing um, is pretty tragic somehow because a lot of people uh, really invested money there and uh, had high hopes for it. And um, yeah, I think every tragic event like this is a big hit in the face of the retro scene somehow. And uh, people will lose trust for upcoming projects. And uh, it's pretty toxic, I think. And um, shouldn't happen that often in my bubble a lot of those high tier influencers in the retro area um they had pre-orders yeah and i was one of the few not having pre-orders i just okay. had a, i just had a pre-order at amazon germany i was mm. like okay if they if they never if they never ship it i will never be charged in the first place yeah, but but I never I never did any you know refundable deposit um, pre-order mm -hmm. in and at, at Amico and so on because in the later well in the later times they stopped at some point processing refunds and stuff. Um, I don't want to go into that, you know. So I decided to wait and see, but of course. Um, it's it's hard to not be part of that bubble if everybody around you is like, oh, of course, I'm friends with uh, with Hans Ippisch and Tommy Tillerico. I pre-ordered my unit, you know, like in Starship Troopers. I did my part, you know. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, um, yeah. mm. let's let's see first how things turn out. I can still order it afterwards, even if not in a special Founders Edition color. Yeah. 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 Oh, then I don't. Then I don't have Founders Edition uh, wood or purple or whatever, but just plain white or black. That would would okay, have been too. fine by me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, one of the original colors was even red. That would be something I, I um, I would have gotten because it's my favorite color. Anyway. It's, it's it's sad to see how things turned out there, and um, it's a lot of dirt throwing around yeah. now, and uh, probably by 
the time passing by and going down the road, there will be more people providing leaks. But yeah. officially, the console is not dead yet. They are still around. But I have seen, I've seen that the Amico homepage, if you go on a pre-order for the games and select, uh, and select, um, and uh, select Europe as a destination country or a region, um, the Shopify link is already down. Oh. It's saying the store is no longer available. So if you want to if you want to pre-order the physical games, you can only do it for Canada or USA anymore. No longer for Europe because the store is down. So that yeah. that alone is a red flag. If it like is. half of your get if if like half of your homepage is outdated and the links are broken, and they don't care of fixing it. A really red flag. A red 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 flag. Yeah, yeah. Better invest, better invest the money in buying some remote stuff. <laughs> at least, example, at least yeah. your stuff is, is shipped. Yeah. I always <laughs> ship in time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, nice. Yeah. Well, so that would be it from my side, my my news parts and that I have, and um, I would say now let's jump to France and speak to to our guest about the well. The uncensored library and in Minecraft and Belarus and stuff and how things turned out and hopefully will improve in a bit. So I'm talk to you then. Bye bye. Bye, bye. bye. We have another guest to our podcast and this time it's actually the third part about our series, the uncensored library, which is a project that was kickstarted from uh, the German reporters without borders. And uh, two years ago, we spoke with uh, Christine Besse from Germany's Department of Reporters Without Borders. And last year, we had the Brazilian head, that was Emmanuel uh, Colombia. And today, we have Jean Cavillia uh, yes, from sure. the, I, I've read from the head of European um, Eastern and Central Asia desk. Yes, exactly. Head of Eastern Europe and Central Asia Desk uh, at uh, RSF International, based in Paris. Thank you for the invitation. Oh, no problem. I mean, the reason, I mean, I, we spoke about it before. The reason why, why I invited you is that uh, last year when the, um, when the Unsensored Library was expanded to um, more rooms, they made, they made an, a special event about the Brazilian room but not really talking about Belarus very much. And that is why I wanted to talk about it with you today. Um, because I'm interested to know if the project in any way, sort of form, in, um, well, influenced the situation in Belarus. I mean, got people more access to it. I mean, Generally speaking, the fact that SSA are based in Paris and not in the country itself already says that the situation probably is much more difficult in Belarus than it is in Brazil. Oh, well, uh, just a guess. I'm not an expert. Uh, but. No, in fact, uh, RSF International is based in Paris and we, don't, we have uh, sections and uh, offices uh, around the world, but uh, not uh, anyway in Eastern Europe and Central Asia Desk. Uh, we are um, we are work with correspondents that are on site. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to <laughs> clarify the situation. Yeah, yeah. Is, uh, is that because it's more dangerous or difficult, or is that how it happens to be? Structural. Okay. It's just structural. It's a, the structure at RSF. It's it's like that. So, yes, but the situation in Belarus is very difficult, uh, let's say, uh, harsh for, for journalists, of course. And uh, that's why um, uh, we uh, try by all means to um, uh, circumvent censorship there. So, yes, you, you spoke about uh, the uh, Uncensored uh, Library uh, project. And... Uh, uh, I've checked the numbers, uh, not only for Belarus, but uh, I've seen that uh, 
the uncensored library has now reached uh, more than 25 million players in over uh, 165 countries. Mm -hmm. So that's quite a lot. Uh, and uh, it's interesting for us uh, to um, uh, reach a young audience through um, uh, this uh, Minecraft uh, game uh, because, of course, most uh, of the players are very young and uh, it's uh, necessary to show them that we have to stand for uh, our right to information all over the world. And the, the wonderful thing is that uh, this um, game allows us to um, put um, censored content, censored articles um, uh, available for uh, these, uh, these readers. So yeah, that's uh, the aim of, uh, of the Uncensored li Library, of course. I mean, how is it basically? I mean, when, when I speak uh, to people that I know on the internet um, from countries where the, well, the reporters don't have freedom, there is no press freedom, they really don't really, I don't know, notice it sometimes, or they are not really aware. I mean, you are sitting actually in front of the map from um, in, of the French yeah. version of the map where f press freedom mm -hmm. is good or not good based on the color of, of the countries. And, yes. and I guess in some cases people don't even know. When, when I spoke to, to my Brazilian friend, they were like, I didn't even know that there are lo lawsuits and people uh, in prison because of press freedom or something they reported on the news, you know? So you're not really aware sometimes, of, at least from what I heard, when you are living in the country itself. Or is it different for Belarus? I don't know. No, of course, uh, that's a big problem for Belarus as well. I mean, uh people who are working, uh, who are uh, living there in the country are um, under a huge uh, propaganda uh, pressure. Um, I, I think that most of the people know that uh, uh, in, uh, in Belarus, uh, they are, uh, I mean, they don't, most of them, I think, uh, don't believe that what I heard from the ground, uh, that they don't believe in uh, in the state media channels or in uh, state media um, uh, outlets anyway uh, but um, still they are thinking that uh, okay we have propaganda here from the government but uh, we have also western propaganda so uh, it's better to focus on our uh, personal life for instance, and uh, not to uh, uh, to question political uh, uh, pol political authorities, political problems. So, I I believe that the main uh, uh, beliefs uh, of the people there, and we have to uh, thanks to this operation and so, so library but also uh, some others we have uh, we have to um, uh, to show that uh, uh, audience a specific audience in this country that uh, uh, there is uh, an independent information from independent uh, journalists that uh, maybe they don't know in their country but we have to uh, make them discover these uh, articles uh, uh, which um, report about uh, their real life uh, in this. Mm -hmm. So if you compare the situation now, I mean, I guess now it's even more difficult because we have the Ukrainian war where Belarus is also a part of it um, from what I heard. But, but I mean, even before did do you think the Unsensored Library as a project improved press freedom or is it more like improving awareness to the young people that you addressed earlier? Um, uh, I, I don't see any difference. Okay. 
Wow. Of course, it's 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 improving uh, um, awareness, of course, of uh, um, the fact press freedom is repressed in Belarus, in Brazil, in some other countries, uh, because uh, when we release um, the fact we uh, uh, we are publishing uh, articles repressed, I mean censored articles uh, from these countries. Uh, that proves that uh, uh, these articles are not uh, that free. There is no freedom of the press in this country. So it's for the general awareness of uh, people around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, but it uh, improves also awareness of uh, uh, gamers, specifically, and uh, of course people who are not uh, playing these games inside in the country uh, cannot access to this information. Hmm. Good point, good point. Well, mm -hmm. if, if you say you don't see much more um, improvement based, based well, from two years ago to now, so don't you think that the newer generation of the people living in the country, now that they are more aware of documents or articles they have access to thanks to the library that they didn't do before that perhaps in the future um the press freedom will change because i don't know i don't know because the public is going to rebel against um against the because government or what yeah exactly i mean i mean we had that we had that in other countries before where um where suddenly the situation changed because we, there was a big riot in the general public. Yeah, we don't call for rebellion. That's not uh, <laughs> uh, <Yes>. our <laughs> purpose. Uh, but we, uh, I mean, uh, as an organization um, defending press freedom, uh, we uh, work also with uh, local authorities when it's possible. Mm. Unfortunately, in Belarus, it's not possible. <laughs> No, um, but we tried uh, in the past to uh, make uh, pressure uh, to pressure uh, Alexander Lukashenko and uh, his government uh, through the European Union, for instance, through the Council of Europe. Uh, and uh, that's uh, the way it, uh, it works. Uh, we. Uh, we try to pressure the authorities uh, concerning uh, the people uh, inside. Yes, uh, we can only make them uh, aware of the fact that press freedom is repressed. And that's uh, one hour of our means. Uh, it's an occasion also to, um, to raise another tool we uh, developed at RSF to, um, uh, to uh, bypass censorship. It's uh, called uh, collateral freedom collateral freedom operation i don't know if you've heard of it uh, but it's a mean uh, to um, uh, i mean the principle is to uh, mirror the websites that means to uh, uh, to make uh, an exact copy of the website of the censored uh, media websites uh, to uh, and to make them available for the general public without a VPN. Uh, so um, we did it for uh, several uh, several uh, media outlets in uh, in Belarus. Uh, six, uh, there is uh, Charter 97, for instance, uh, uh, Tribuna Nashaniva, which is uh, the um, uh, the oldest media outlet uh, uh, in the country, uh, and so on. And uh, so uh, the exact copy of uh, this web, their website is um, uh, put on uh, CDNs, uh, that means uh, content delivery networks, uh, that also host many other services and therefore cannot be easily blocked by the authorities. Uh, the the um, if uh, the authoritarian government uh, want to uh, to to target directly these CDNs, uh, they suffer themselves uh, the collateral damage of uh, blocking 
uh, their own access to uh, all other services provided by this CDN. It uh, creates many problems for them. Uh, it has an impact also uh, on the um, webs, many websites. And uh, if they manage to, if ever they manage to block this website, uh, it's very easily for RSF to uh, put the site back again online. Hmm. So that's uh, that's another tool we use, and we try to uh, uh, to be creative uh, with the, on on the way to to bypass this censorship. Um, yeah, it's called collateral freedom operation. We we relaunched it. I mean, we we used to do it for Belarus. We relaunched it uh, recently after the um, uh, huge uh, repression uh, in uh, Russia, especially, and in Ukraine in the uh, occupied territories. Wow. So yeah. so you are also uh, responsible for for the continent, well for the country of Russia, I guess. Yes, yes. Ah, okay. Well, so basically, we can make two interviews now about the situation in Russia as well. Well, this is, I mean, for, for, for me, the situation is kind of difficult because the question is, um, how do you actually handle it? I mean, there are one pe there, there's one side of society saying the Russians are at fault and others say, no, the general public isn't at fault. It's basically uh, the president only. But then the older generation often believes in what is in the what is said in the propaganda, you know. So uh, people who don't really have access to the internet or don't don't use VPNs. So it's um, I guess it's a it's a difficult situation, you know. Yeah, it's a uh, it's very difficult situation, and uh, it leads to. Um to fights in inside families even um, because uh, most many Russians have links and uh, especially family links with uh, uh, Ukrainians so uh, it's uh, it's a uh, very dramatic uh, very dramatic uh, we, we've seen very dramatic personal situations uh, concerning um, press freedom yes um, Maybe you know, or maybe not. Uh, VPNs are forbidden in Russia. Oh, I didn't know. Uh, okay. Yeah, but it's uh, already a long time ago. It's forbidden <laughs> since a long time. But uh, still, the people uh, uh, use VPNs, and uh, until recently, it was. I mean, it's it's not uh, dangerous for them to use a VPN. Uh, the problem is that uh, since um, the beginning of the war. Uh, the uh, Roskomnadzor, which is uh, the uh, federal uh, communication authorities, I mean, uh, the censor in chief, um, tries to uh, to hunt the VPNs and uh, they block uh, VPNs, more and more VPNs. So that's, uh, it, it starts to be a problem because wow more and more people um, don't have access uh, to VPNs and so don't have access to uh, the outer world. And uh, that's, that's a big problem we have to face and uh, we have to, um, to find solutions, uh, I hope so, um, in the coming years. Um, and um, Another thing is that uh, almost all the media, independent media websites now in uh, Russia are censored. So without VPN, you don't have access to them. Uh, so more and more uh, readers go to Telegram channels. It was already used a lot by the Russian audience but uh, um, and Belarusian audience. Um, but we see more and more uh, readers uh, switching to a Telegram channel. But of course, on Telegram, you have independent media, but you have also uh, many uh, propaganda outlets. That's, uh, that's quite difficult and you have to, uh, uh, to be 
to have a clear view of what is propaganda, what is a propaganda or not. And uh, it's a question of education at the end. So that's, uh, that's very difficult. I agree that um, um, older people or um, people in, in a countryside where there is no internet access in Russia have access only to, uh, uh, to mainly to, to television channels and uh, all television channels are owned by the state or they are um, uh, for governmental channels. Um, no, the, the last uh, independent channel uh, was closed uh, in March. I can't remember the date exactly. It's Euronews, but it was closed uh, in March uh, after the war because of the danger for journalists to be, uh, uh, I mean, to continue their work because uh, journalists uh, that uh, remain in Russia now uh, face uh, 15 years in prison because of fake news about uh, the army or about uh, state organs. And you have to know that in Russia, um, as in Belarus, <laughs> it's the same, uh, the definition, um, the definitions are, uh, in the law are not clear. So uh, it's up to the judges. And the judges are submitted to the political authorities. So um, you understand how dangerous it is for journalists in Russia. Every day uh, we uh, monitor exactions against uh, Russian journalists. Wow. Well, I mean, the interesting thing is, I don't know, of course, how it is in France, but at least I can speak from the German, from the Germany side point of view. That's the first time that a news outlet was forbidden in my country, which is Russia Today, RT. It's the first time that I saw that um, that the highest court ruled that, that Russia Today must be blocked by uh, by the big internet providers. Um, that's like wow! I've never heard of that before. Um, so, and yeah. um, I, I wonder if if now that it's done with with uh, Russia today, uh, and of course other sites too, like some uh, other you know adult entertainment sites. If if that if this um, war in you in, in the Ukraine and blocking Russia today well or RT as they call themselves now if if that isn't opening the door for future reasons to to also block other news outlets that don't spread propaganda so I think it's always difficult if you have a starting point where you yeah. block block a website or a news outlet that at some point you lose control and then okay i block this and then i block mm -hmm. that and then mm -hmm. it's like a, a domino effect that mm. you just you throw yeah. over one stone and the mm. other stones are falling consequentially at least that's yeah. my opinion i don't know if you can concur yeah. with that but um yeah of course uh we uh fight for press freedom uh so uh we uh were uh I mean, we understood this decision, but we were disappointed because uh, it's a politically motivated decision to uh, ban RT in uh, Europe and uh, a quick decision um, made uh, on, in, on, I mean, it was an emergency decision, emergency case. Uh, so um, that's uh, why we uh, proposed but we already proposed before, but they didn't listen to us, uh, a reciprocity mechanism for a Europe. So um, uh, the, the, um, the fact uh, that this kind of sanctions must be uh, legal in Europe and legally, um, how do you say, um, legally made i mean it it must be a legal procedure uh it not 
it can't be a uh, um, decision made in urgency like that. So, uh, and so the, the reci this uh, reciprocity mechanism, which is quite complicated and I won't uh, develop here, um, make it, uh, um, I mean, the, uh, the, uh, the criteria applied for media outlets in Europe, media outlets that have to, um, uh, I mean, to uh, reflect uh, freedom of speech and uh, uh, have some criteria like uh, transparency and so on, uh, must be the same uh, for uh, the foreign uh, TV channels who would like to enter in Europe. And uh, the countries uh, that uh, uh, the media from the countries that want to enter into Europe and to, to be um, uh, to be uh, um, sorry, I forgot the term in English uh, aired <laughs> to be aired in Europe uh, must uh, must also uh, accept independent uh, media in their country. So that's a kind of reciprocity and uh, it's, uh, I think it will be clearer and uh, safer uh, for uh, media outlets in Europe to, uh, to have such guarantees for the future. That's why we try to uh, uh, to advocate to uh, for this uh, this uh, mechanisms. Mm. Yes, the, the interesting thing is it's kind of a tiger without tooth because personally I didn't even notice that it was blocked because I'm not using the DNS server of my provider because I'm using a different one because um, the one for my provider is kind of slow in comparison. So I never used the dns server to to go to russia today or any other news outlet or website i always used one from america so i never i never was affected by the plug because mm -hmm. I, I only read it in the news that, that by the way uh, rt isn't accessible anymore in germany i'm like okay i can access it fine so so in the end the, the, in, in Europe, uh, yes, you can you can uh, access to VPN, so you yeah, can... you, you don't even need a VPN. You you just use a different DNS server, uh, yes. and, and even that. And if 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 like in my case, you are using a different one anyway because you don't like to use the one of your internet provider, then you are never affected of the block. So so in a way, I guess the target by this immersion situation to disallow people to have access to harmful propaganda news like RT um, is kind of not working because if because people people who have bad intentions are especially the ones that will Google how to work around the block you know so mm -hmm. I mean at least from my opinion if you if you want evil, you will do evil, and and such a thing like a DNS-based block will not stop you. Uh, it, the answer is just yeah. uh, is just a Google search away. So um, I understand that from the law point of view, it's probably easy because you have done something against it, you know. But on the other hand, you don't you don't you didn't do in, enough, you know. If 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 the blockage is so easy to pass by, it's not really it's not really successful. Effective. Effective. Okay. Effective is mm -hmm. the word exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, of course, I'm working in IT. It's easy for me. But but for example, my mom, she wouldn't even try to access RT because because she f for once she wouldn't even know that RT is a thing. And secondly, she wouldn't even want to read to read such propaganda news, you know. So yeah, um, so yeah, it's yeah. The, the the I mean the aim is to uh, to uh, make them work uh, less easy, of course. Hmm. Yeah, right. So um, 
So now let's talk about the situation um, perhaps before the war and now that the war started. Did it become in Belarus more dangerous and difficult for journalists or is that also something... You mean... Yeah, yeah I mean... You... Yeah. Uh, si since the war in Ukraine? Yes. Uh, for the situation in Belarus is not better. Of mm -hmm. course. Uh, by the way, in the our index uh, map, I mean our ranking, uh, press freedom ranking, uh, it's um, Belarus is uh, ranked one hundred fifty third out of one hundred eighty countries. Mm -hmm. It's quite bad. <laughs> I mean, the, that means the situation there is is very. Uh, very difficult in terms of press freedom. Uh, yes, so since the war, of course, uh, uh, it's not better. Um, I mean, the repression in Belarus didn't uh, didn't stop or step back. Uh, we've uh, seen, uh, especially, yes, uh, se several uh, several uh, journalists were. Uh, sentenced to several years in prison, oh. and uh, you, we have uh, 29 journalists in and media workers in prison right now. Um, to to understand, uh, first, uh, uh, when the when the demonstration started uh, in Belarus uh, to, uh, uh, I mean, people in the street. Uh, wanted a new election because they thought uh, the election was um, fabricated uh, and uh, was stolen by uh, Alexander Lukashenko, the president. Uh, and um, and so this uh, uh, this huge uh, demonstration started. Uh, the the authorities started to uh, to be scared of this. Never seen. Uh, massive demonstrations. Uh, they blocked the internet for three days in a row, so people didn't have access to internet, and especially journalists didn't have access to internet to um, publish the news. So it was for the, the first three days of the repression. And during that time and uh, several months after, when the demonstrations um, continued, uh, the journalists were uh, especially targeted uh, by the authorities uh, because, uh, of course, they spread the, the fact that there were a demonstration and huge demonstration in the country. So uh, the, the authority, the policemen, uh, started to uh, target them specifically. So after a few days, the journalists started to um, uh, to stop wearing press jacket because before uh, August 2020, uh, before the election, presidential election, it was quite it was safer, more or less, to uh, wear a press jacket uh, during demonstrations because uh, uh, you were uh, not targeted by the police. But after that, uh, they started to, to to target the journalists. They started with massive arrest of journalists uh, that were covering demonstrations so uh, during the first months. So we've seen uh, hundreds, hundreds of journalists uh, uh, put in jail for, um, for a few days, uh, sometimes uh, two weeks or three weeks. It was administrative arrest, not more. And after uh, they started to uh, uh, focus more on uh, their management. So uh, management of independent media outlets. And as you know, it was not easy to be a journalist in Belarus even before the starting of this repression. So uh, there is there are not so many outlets, independent outlets in Belarus. So they were uh, focusing on their management. Uh, trying to um, uh, enhance uh, them uh, uh, to stop working. Uh, and uh, we, we've seen the first uh, case 
of um, uh, criminal cases. So uh, it was uh, it was uh, Katarina Andreeva uh, and uh, Daya Chutsova were uh, arrested in November and uh, were um, uh, sentenced to uh, two years in prison. So uh, more a longer longer sentence uh, in February. So that was the first criminal case. Uh, sentenced in Belarus in wow. February 2021. Uh, but after that, we've seen um, waves of uh, searches in, uh, in uh, editorial, um, editorial uh, staff uh, houses and uh, in, uh, in, uh, in media outlets uh, offices. And the uh, many criminal cases against management. Uh, that means uh, that is, uh, for instance, tax evasion. Uh, it can be organization of uh, mass riots, uh, treason, and more and more it was uh, extremism. So you now dozens of uh, media outlets in Belarus are uh, labeled extremists. Wow. That means uh, the their journalists can be um, can face up to seven years in prison, and not only their journalists but their readers, because if you are um, if you are uh, propagating uh, an article from a media outlet co uh, labeled labeled as um, as extremist, you also can be put in jail. Uh, so uh, the problem is that people can't share articles from independent press. Uh, they can be put in jail for that. So the thing is that, uh, of course, and media uh, uh, websites are blocked, censored. Uh, so it's uh, very difficult for uh, media outlets to um, I mean, to um, re uh, to establish access to, to information for their readers. Uh, and uh, we can say here that uh, platforms don't help and social networks don't help, for instance, Facebook, because uh, Facebook is is quite used in uh, uh, in Belarus for um, for article or I mean, among Belarusian audience uh, for their articles, and uh, for instance, uh, they, they are uh, their articles are not shared because it's too dangerous, and uh, so uh, these kind of articles is not uh, uh, are not visible on the platform. <laughs> that's that's uh, one point and uh, a problem we have to to um, to face, and I hope we will. Uh, find a solution, but we have to work with uh, Facebook uh, on mm -hmm. that, for instance. Uh, but most people are on Telegram now, and uh, they use Telegram channel uh, to uh, uh, propagate their article. Um, yeah, and so uh, so uh, massive arrest after uh, criminal cases and uh, extremism uh, charges. Um, so it continues. Uh, we have uh, last week we had the, the um, trial of three journalists, uh, more than sorry, uh, six journalists. Uh, so things uh, continue. I mean, repression continues to um, in Belarus. Interestingly, sorry. all the censorship um, has some kind of loopholes you know um because yeah. um because in we always have a new section in in front of um our interviews and we also had some weeks back a new section where we reported about um a museum of um computer history in the ukraine in kiev that was bombed and destroyed 
and tons of Commodore 64s and other old computers were destroyed. And I was sure, because we are also listed in Yandex podcasts, and I was sure that they have some kind of, you know, um, artificial intelligence running, checking the audio or our page for links to the episodes that would remove this episode or the podcast altogether. So... I thought as soon as I publish this episode, I will certainly get an email from Yandex like, we have to remove your podcast. Nothing happened, actually. So it seems the censorship in Russia has some limits because they are not, they are not going to, to extreme measurements despite the yeah. technology is there. You can run artificial intelligence that detects um, what is spoken I mean, YouTube is using that for for subtitles generation, you know. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, the, uh, you uh, you raise a very important point uh, about Yandex, because of course uh, I haven't spoken about that, but uh, Yandex, uh, which is um, for governmental uh, research engine, uh, is um, censored is censoring. Uh, independent websites. And the problem is that Yandex is the most efficient uh, and uh, most used uh, research engine uh, for the uh, Russian speakers. So that's a big problem uh, raised by uh, media outlets, as I mean, in, uh, in Belarus, in, in Russia, in Ukraine, especially. Um, and uh, there are means to circumvent this censorship. I mean, Belarusian um, journalists are working on that topic since uh, year and a half now, and uh, so they found some uh, loopholes. Uh, but I won't speak publicly about it. But if journalists uh, are interested, sure. they can come to me to, uh, to sure. have details. Sure. Yeah. Well, uh, just wanted to mention it because I was certain. I was certain that we will get blocked or censored because we mentioned the Russian um, Ukrainian situation and we didn't call it special operation, but nothing happened. Nothing happened. Um, so they they didn't they didn't notice yeah. it. It seems. Yeah. You you you, you know uh, there are uh, even in Belarus and uh, in Russia now. Uh, despite uh, the very difficult environment and uh, the dangerosity of their work, there are courageous uh, journalists who continue to work and who call a war a war, <laughs> and uh, they, they still continue. I mean, uh, hundreds, hundreds of journalists had uh, to flee the country, uh, but uh, some of them, they, they the state and uh, they try to to work um, they work undercover mostly uh, but also um, there are mainly local journalists I mean in region uh, that continue to work till the last moment till the authority will will notice the work and uh, um, and uh, start to uh, uh to harass them um so they they are um they have a suitcase ready to flee uh all the documents prepared and so on uh, because it's very dangerous of course but uh, they continue their work they continue to report about the consequences of the war for uh, russia and uh, about uh, repression for uh, belarus and so it's uh, uh, it's important to underline that journalists, uh, there are journalists in the country and they continue to work and they continue to, to report to show uh, what's going on in their country. Yeah. Now we, we, we um, spoke about how situations worst and as I said at the beginning, um, you, you didn't see much change. Um, since the uh, Antisword Library was generated two years ago, when it comes to press freedom. 
But is there also something positive we could mention? I don't know. Is there anything? Um... I mean, uh, the uh, uh, the positive thing I see is this uh, wonderful solidarity between journalists, uh, independent journalists in uh, in Belarus. It's uh, very exceptional. We, um, I mean, we have a partner, uh, the Belarusian Association of Journalists. Uh, very professional, and uh, all the um, almost all the the independent uh, media outlets are part of uh, this uh, uh, this uh, association, and they um, they showed uh, great solidarity, and they support each other. Uh, they support each other um, burden when one is uh, targeted. Uh, by the authorities and so on, and it's uh, that's wonderful to see that. And they are very professional, despite uh, despite uh, the repression. Uh, many of them continue to uh, to work independently and uh, to work, uh, 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 let's say, with uh, uh, an honest point of view on what's going on. I mean, they are not activists; they are journalists, and uh, that's very important. Uh, for that's very important uh, for the diversity of uh, opinion and quality of journalism in the country. Also in uh, in Russia, also it starts to to uh, to be the same process. We've seen uh, also another. I mean, other positive news are that uh, um, they started to uh, uh, to create other forms of journalism. And especially to adapt uh, to uh, new constraints, especially to adapt to Telegram channels, since Telegram is not yet locked in uh, Belarus or in Russia. Um, that uh, I think that's positive, and also they they uh, they started to uh, uh, to take more uh, sources from, let's say citizen journalists or just people um, of course they continue even when they are I mean the journalists continue even when they are in exile to check different sources and uh, to uh, to be sure the news is uh, uh, is correct and so on uh, so they continue to work like that but uh, uh, some of them have uh, citizen journalists on the ground uh, who are uh, gathering information because they are less exposed than them and uh, that's a new way of working mm. that's interesting and by the way for um for russian belarusian ukrainian journalists we uh, built a gx fund which is a journalist journalism in exile fund uh, it's uh, proposed uh, since uh, um, since the war for uh, journalists would like to quickly uh, continue to work uh, from their country of exile, and uh, that's uh, uh, that's I think that's very important for the quality of journalism uh, and for in the future in their country because we hope they will be able to come back one day uh, and uh, for uh, the the peace the future peace and democracy in russia and in belarus it's uh, very important to have journalists uh, working uh, even from outside or with a part of uh, the the editorial uh, staff out, outside the country uh, to continue to work on uh, uh, and to report uh, about what's going on in the country. We need their work. That's essential. Hmm. Yeah. But, but the one thing that I noticed going back to the map that is behind you, uh, yeah. comparis comparing the year last year, 2021 and 2020, since the pandemic, COVID-19, the um, rating of Germany and other European countries went down a few notches because of um, journalists being attacked by, you know, by uh, conspiracy people saying um, 
COVID-19 isn't a thing and the pandemic isn't a pandemic and it's all thought up. And then there are people on the street in major cities, you know, and, and then people, um, journalists are attacked either by those protesting or sometimes even by the police siding with the protesters. So I think that's somehow all in all a, a sad, a sad um, development for, for Europe even. Um, I mean, you personally noticed it yourself because you're in France. So despite you are responsible for, um, as I said, Asia, you know, um, the, the, as you as you are working for Reporters Without Borders, you probably instantly notice things that are different in France now compared to before the pandemic started. Or oh, is it yes. just, just, just a German thing? Aren't there protests and conspiracy people in France saying COVID-19 isn't a thing? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I mean, um... Uh, we've noticed uh, this year with the the ranking that uh, uh, there were since we 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 since RSF publishes its ranking uh, there there were no such um, um, short list of uh, countries in green. I mean countries where the situation of press freedom is is more or less uh, okay. I mean better uh better in the world i mean the the mess the um the first part of the ranking uh has never been so short so and it's mostly europe uh so yes uh, i think uh, uh probably the pandemic had a role in this uh in this situation unfortunately Wow. Yeah, and probably also the uh, Russian disinformation um, and propaganda towards Europe. Oh, yes, yes. I've I actually seen a report about that on YouTube the other day. The influence of Europe coming outside of Russia regarding propaganda. And it's like, like so sub subtle that you even don't notice it. <laughs> because yeah. I was like... Is there propaganda next to RT? Not that I know of. Perhaps there mm. is, and it's so it's so thin that you don't immediately notice it. Probably like yeah. that. Yes, yes. You you have uh, uh, you know uh, troll farms where people. I mean, in Russia, well, not only in Russia, but in in most country, most. Uh, ex uh, 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 country um, uh, that uh, uh, have this kind of uh, farm trolls with people uh, paid to uh, to put uh, negative comment comments or um, um, to, uh, to 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 put uh, false information about things but you know um, yeah, the disinformation can be very subtle, of course. It's uh, uh, you have uh, several techniques, and uh, uh, one of them is to uh, to to report uh, sixty percent of uh, uh, true things, for instance, in an article, and uh, forty or even less, twenty ten percent of uh, false information. And uh, so globally, it it seems to be realistic and to be to be true. Hmm. So uh, that's a, that's the kind of inf of disinformation. Uh, but you've seen, for instance, uh, maybe you you've seen this um, French reporter um, who lost his life in Ukraine recently, Frederic. Uh, uh, Le, Cler Le Clerimov. I've heard about so, it. Yeah. Yes, he was killed uh, in Ukraine uh, when uh, he was uh, uh, in the front line in uh, Lysychansk near Severodonetsk uh, in a um, um, humanitarian aid um, truck. 
um, he was killed by um, a missile on the track and uh, probably from the Russian forces. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, the the biggest uh, news uh, Russian state agency called TASS um, published uh, real, uh, an article saying that he was a mercenary and uh, he was uh, uh, to bring um, uh, weapons to uh, to Lysychansk, which is completely false okay. uh, this uh, journalist is uh, i mean is well known in uh, uh, his uh, editorial stuff bfm tv he was with two other i mean with a journalist and a fixer uh, and um, he was doing nothing than his work and you know he was as at the front of this truck because he was filming so he was doing this job and uh, tas published it that uh, he's probably probably that's the word <laughs> it's not maybe it's not totally false because it's probably a mercenary but we don't we know it's it's not uh, and uh, it's uh, it used also the the words of uh, an uh, obscure officer from the uh, LNR so the Lugansk uh, uh, self-proclaimed republic, uh, saying that this man was probably a mercenary. So you know, wow. um, the journalist didn't write. Um, I mean, completely false information. They so were just releasing information from this officer, but. Um, what uh, do you what do you um, see when uh, you see this news? You see that oh, it was not journalist; it was a mercenary. True, true. Yes, yeah. yes, I understand. The false information is mostly that what people are focusing on, and yeah. the other part that is true is actually like details that isn't so important for the old news item. There. Yeah, and, and anyway, no, nothing, nothing was true in this news. But uh, the only thing true is was uh, it was probably that uh, this uh, this officer said that to to the task agency uh, mm -hmm. journalists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, so let's hope that there is some hope for the future. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean all, that's yeah. that that's why we. Um, uh, we've created, uh, along with two uh, German uh, foundation, this uh, journalism in exile fund, GX fund, uh, to, uh, I mean, because we uh, we need to prepare the future, future of journalism, which is also the future of democracy and future of uh, peace in uh, in these countries. Yes. So, so how can how can people contact you when they need help or want more information? Uh, I, I think they can go to the website rsf.org and uh, to, or to address me an email at uh, gcavalier at rsf.org or Europe, simply Europe at rsf.org. Yeah. Ah, right. So it's, ah, you have a general email too. Yes. Well, yeah. I, I took the time to generally search for you. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Um, so I think, well, well, there's one thing I, I never really asked you about, but how did it happen that you worked for RSF? I mean, do you want to talk about it? How, how did you get to work there? I mean, I mean, working for an organization like Reporters Without Borders must be uh, pretty difficult. I mean, frustrating in one part and also very, very, um, well, very intense. Very intense, and also, yeah. I guess, I mean, um, RSF is also, you know, helping people in prison and stuff, you know, and awareness and, uh, as I said, funds for for journalists in trouble and stuff. So, mm -hmm. it it must be, um, I don't know how to say, a double um, a double edged sword 
in one one side it's a very good job that you are doing on the other hand it can be frustrating and mm -hmm. disappointing oh, I, I i i confirm but uh, if i still work here that means uh, <laughs> uh the 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 positive part uh, is um is even more uh, um important uh i think uh, because we uh i mean we get up we because we are a uh, staff here and uh, we get up in the morning we we know that uh, we try to uh, to do our best for our uh, colleagues around the world and uh, uh, for press freedom in general uh, even in uh, difficult areas as uh, uh, you've seen Ukraine, Russia, and uh, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and so on. Uh, so uh, that's uh, very motivating. Uh, it can be frustrating because, uh, yes, sometimes um, uh, there is no changes, positive changes. Uh, but if we don't, if we don't do it, I mean, who, who else will do it? We need to. Uh, uh, to uh, to fight for press freedom, otherwise uh, nobody will uh, do it uh, for us. So that's why. <laughs> and um, I about uh, how I got there. It's I'm uh, I work as a journalist uh, since I um, I've uh, ended my studies of journalism, and uh, and I was correspondent in Moscow for a few years. Uh, and uh, when I came back to France, I've, I've uh, worked a bit for a newspaper called uh, Le Monde uh, for uh, some time. And after that, I've decided to, uh, to move to another kind of job uh, to help uh, press freedom and to help uh, people and to be more focused on the, uh, this area that I like very much. Mm. Yeah. Probably because of the people and the culture, and not because of the difficulties coming with them. Not right? because, <laughs> not because of the authoritarian regimes, of course. Yes, yes. Um, yeah. But but I mean, I mean, there was this comment I made at the beginning of the interview that um, that probably would be very difficult to have an office in in Belarus because mm -hmm. of the. Impossible. Impossible, right? Impossible. Yeah. Uh, all the NGOs uh, are forbidden in Belarus. Uh, it was, uh, I mean, our partner, Vaj, uh, was uh, uh, forbidden, uh, so Belarusian Association of Journalists uh, was forbidden in um, uh, late, late August. So, uh, and since uh, then, all the organization had to, to close Wow. So they were forbidden by the authorities. So, of course, Reporters Without Bullet never had um, uh, an office there and uh, it won't happen now anyway. Yeah. yeah. Because from the first from the first point of view was like, why is the office in per Paris, right? Why, why isn't the office somewhere in the East Asian area, you know? <laughs> they were like, mm. Mm, okay no because i mean the that's uh, uh, sorry uh, i meant uh, i meant eastern europe i meant eastern yeah, europe yeah. eastern europe yes and, uh, and central like asia that. exactly yes yeah. um rsf was created in paris in uh, 1985 uh, by uh, by french by a french staff so uh, that's why the rsf international is located in paris and after uh, rsf started to open uh, uh, sections and uh, offices um, uh, all around the world, but uh, mostly we work with correspondents that are in that in these countries. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, so thanks a lot. Well, I'm happy we, we we surpassed one hour. You were like in your emails, you were like, I'm not sure if if I have so much to say, but um, well, yeah. Thank we, we spoke yeah. Lot. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation, and uh, it was a pleasure to 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 popularize the fact that uh, yes, there is press freedom problems in Belarus. Yes. 
Well, I tried to to bring up question that that nobody asked before. I was watching old interviews with you, and yeah. of course, when you look on YouTube, at least in your English interviews, it's always you are always saying the same things, you know. <laughs> of course, when we have five minutes to uh, to raise the cases, of course. We, right, uh, right. We, we, we raise the same, yes. Well, so thanks a lot yeah. for your time and I hope thanks. you have, you have um, much success in your work, you know. And um, I hope so, yes. Thank you very much. Well, hopefully, yeah. hopefully, when uh, hopefully this U Ukraine and the COVID situation will be resolved both at some point and then we can go back to a different and better normal. Because yes. right now, for me at least, it feels like the world is getting crazier every day a bit more. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, but uh, we have to focus on uh, positive changes. Uh, sometimes uh, journalists are released. Uh, sometimes uh, a law is, um, is uh, how do you say, uh, erased. Uh, I mean, diversity laws are erased. So. Yes, it's small changes, but positive. We have to focus on that, not to be depressed. Yes. Great. Well, so yes. thanks a lot for your time. And yes, um, thank you. No problem. And I will look forward to when we release this, if I get an email from Yandex or not, <laughs> <laughs> that we have been okay. removed. <laughs> let well, me know. So, um, so have a good evening. Yes. And I will let you know yes. when we release this issue, right? this podcast thank you very much thank you you too thank you bye 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 Jörg. bye <laughs> bye